Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the terrifying case of Debbie Lindsley and a crime which altered the way that many women travelled in the 1980s. Debbie was born in Bromley in Kent, although Bromley is now more commonly known as being part of Greater London, in 1962 to Arthur and Marguerite Lindley. She had a younger brother whose name was Gordon. By the age of 26, Debbie had moved out of the family home and had moved up to Edinburgh in Scotland where she worked at the Dragonara Hotel. At that time, the Dragonara Hotel attracted a range of A-list clients, including the likes of David Bowie, Elizabeth Taylor and Sean Connery. It was an exciting place to work and was seen at the time as one of the best, if not the best, hotel in Edinburgh. Debbie's colleagues described her as a popular, conscientious and hard-working member of staff. In March 1988, Debbie had returned from Scotland to stay with her parents in Bromley while she attended a hotel management course. On Wednesday the 23rd of March, 26-year-old Debbie had lunch with her brother Gordon, after which he gave her a lift to Petswood Station, where Debbie would board the train to make the first leg of her journey back to Edinburgh. She was due to see her family again a couple of weeks later when she would return to Kent to be a bridesmaid at her brother's wedding. Debbie boarded the 2.16pm train bound for London, Victoria. The train was scheduled to make 10 stops. Bickley, Bromley South, Shortlands, Beckenham Junction, Kent House, Penge East, Sydenham Hill, West Dulwich, Herne Hill, and Brixton before arriving at London Victoria 34 minutes later at 2.50 p.m. This particular train had a mixture of carriage types. Some were fully open with a central aisle running the full length of each carriage and access to adjacent carriages at either end. Others had the full width compartments, each seating 12 with an external door on either side of the train. When in these carriages, you would have no way of moving from compartment to compartment within the train. The only way to change carriage would be to exit the train at a station, walk along the platform and enter another carriage from the outside. Debbie sat in one of these enclosed carriages on that day. She had possibly chosen this particular carriage as it was one of the few that allowed smoking on board. The train arrived at Platform 2 at London Victoria just before 3pm. Upon its arrival, it was customary for a British rail porter to walk through the train, checking each carriage. On this day, this responsibility fell to Mr Ronald Lacey. When he entered the carriage where Debbie had been travelling, he found her body on the floor in a pool of blood. She had been brutally attacked at some point during the previous 34 minutes. She sustained 11 stab wounds to her face, neck, chest and abdomen, including five wounds around her heart, one of which was the fatal blow. She had extensive defensive wounds on her hands and it was believed that she had tried desperately to fight off her attacker. The police ruled out robbery as a motive her handbag and holder were found next to her body as she was still wearing her jewellery. And a spokesman from Scotland Yard stated that they believe she may have been trying to defend herself from a sex attack. They believed that the attack, whilst premeditated, was totally random. As news of Debbie's brutal murder broke, it once again shone a harsh spotlight on the dangers of small, enclosed train carriages. These were known to be unsafe particularly at night, and as Debbie's murder was investigated, one only had to look at the number of similar cases that this could be linked to, to understand the extent of this problem. Debbie was used to travelling and fully aware of the dangers of the enclosed carriages, and would always try to avoid using them, particularly at night. Her mother stated that, this has shown that no one is safe, adding that her daughter was on a daytime train from a busy station going about her normal life. 
Meanwhile, British Rail emphasised that trains always had at least some corridor-type carriages to give passengers a choice between corridor and non-corridor seats. They had already been phasing out enclosed carriages, aiming to remove them completely by 1991, and within a week of the murder, they announced that the number used on off-peak journeys would be reduced to minimise the chance of passengers being isolated. Additionally, a red band was painted along the coaches without corridors to allow passengers to identify them prior to boarding the train. The Metropolitan Police Senior Investigating Officer, Superintendent Guy Mills, described the crime as savage and brutal. Debbie had no means of escape apart from through the side doors onto the railway track and due to the ferocity of the attack, he believed that it had not been the killer's first. The police appealed for anyone who had been a passenger on the train to come forward, believed to be around 70 people. But despite numerous appeals, including Crime Watch UK on the 14th of April 1988, many passengers remained unaccounted for interviewing. The police were particularly keen to trace a passenger described as a short, stocky man who was seen jumping from the train at Victoria, either from a single compartment in the vicinity or the same one where the murder occurred. They were also looking for a man who was seen leaving a compartment of the train at Penge East before reboarding, possibly into the same compartment as Debbie. He was described as a scruffy, heavily built man with shoulder-length dirty blonde hair. An artist's impression was released of this particular man. Another man was seen with a cut on his head at Victoria Station, and the police were also searching for a man who a 19-year-old woman collided with as she headed towards Debbie's carriage on the train, resulting in her turning and sitting in the next carriage. They believed that the murder weapon was a heavy knife with a blade of between five and seven and a half inches long, and several miles of train line were searched in an attempt to find the murder weapon. This was unsuccessful. A French au pair, Miss Hélène Yousselon, came forward and reported that she had heard loud screams soon after the train left Brixton. This, in addition to the fact that Debbie had smoked two cigarettes and eaten part of a sandwich since boarding the train, led investigators to believe that Debbie was attacked during the six-minute journey from Brixton to London, Victoria. Helene also described a red-haired man who she had seen at the time, with another person detailing a man with red hair who had been seen concealing a knife at Victoria Station. Despite extensive appeals and searches, this man, or men, could not be found. It was discovered that some of the blood in the carriage did not belong to Debbie and was assumed to be from injuries that her killer would have sustained as she fought off his attack. This blood was collected and stored. After much soul-searching, Debbie's brother Gordon got married on the 9th of April in a church just a short distance away from where he had last seen his sister. Debbie's funeral was held on the 22nd of April 1988 at the Holy Trinity Church in Bromley. She was buried wearing the turquoise bridesmaid's dress that she should have worn to celebrate her brother's wedding. Over the following months, the police took over 1,200 witness statements and 650 people were questioned and ultimately were ruled out of the inquiry. An inquest was held on the 16th of November 1988, where the au pair who had heard the screams on the line that day provided a written statement. I heard screams, very, very loud voices. They were those of a woman and very high-pitched. I have never heard such screams. They were screams of fear. They stopped, then started again. They lasted one minute to two minutes. I thought it was young men who wanted to tease a young girl. Then I realised it was more serious. I thought it was a woman being attacked. I wanted to raise the alarm, but remained glued to my seat. I was really afraid and wanted to get to Victoria. She went on to say that when she got out of the train, her attention was immediately drawn to a man with messy red hair. He seemed to have got out of the compartment behind mine. I saw him sideways on. He was a white man, about 40 years old, well-built, fat rather than muscular. 
His hair was red like the Duchess of York's. Helene did not contact the police until later that evening when her employer told her that there had been a murder on the train. She was criticised by the coroner, Dr David Knapman, for not pulling the communication cord even though she believed that someone was being attacked. He went on to deliver further criticism of members of the public who witnessed crimes but then failed to do anything and that although passengers heard a commotion, nobody investigated. A verdict of unlawful killing was issued. Links to many other similar cases were explored. A 17-year-old German au pair called Heidi was stabbed to death on the same train line 15 years earlier. She was also travelling in a single closed carriage and her murder remained unsolved. A 59-year-old woman came forward to state that she had been attacked and sexually assaulted on a train between Nottingham and Leeds on the 2nd of March. This attack occurred in an open carriage and the woman came forward after learning of Debbie's murder. A woman travelling in a first-class carriage from London, Victoria had her blouse ripped off and was slashed across her chest, arms and face when she hesitated before giving the attacker her purse. In 1990, a French student jumped from a moving train to escape a man who was attempting to sexually assault her. She survived that event, but suffered severe burns. Even though thousands of man-hours were dedicated to the case, it went nowhere. Despite the promises of British Rail, single compartment carriages were still in use in 1992 due to lack of money for new stock. They then set a new target of phasing these out completely by the summer of 1993. As DNA profiling technology advanced, the case was reopened and a complete DNA profile built from the blood that had been found in the carriage at the time of Debbie's murder. With this, and the belief that the killer was most likely a repeat violent offender, it was hoped that Debbie's murder would finally be solved. However, to the surprise of those involved, the DNA did not produce any matches. Debbie's mother died in 2013 without ever finding out who murdered her daughter. On the 30th anniversary of the murder, Debbie's father was still publicly appealing for help in finding answers as to what happened to his daughter that day and who was responsible for her murder. But with each year that passes, it would seem that any chance of this happening dwindles still further. That concludes today's case. Please click like and comment down below and subscribe if you're new to the channel. Due to time constraints this week, I'm sorry but I haven't had time to do petty crime. Thank you for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. An article in the Edinburgh Live website stated... In June 2022, the hotel that Debbie used to work at in Scotland was the worst rated hotel in Edinburgh. Hopefully things have improved for them now. Goodbye.